We're going to bow together in prayer and ask the Lord for his blessing and his presence. Our Father in heaven, we draw near to thee this evening in and through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We thank thee that that blood was shed all those years ago at Calvary, shed for rebels, shed for sinners. And we thank thee that we can also say shed for us, shed for me. Lord, we can make it that personal this evening. For we can come to know the cleansing power of the precious blood of Jesus Christ in our own lives. And we thank thee this evening that there is a way of salvation. There is a way of cleansing from sin. And Lord, sin is the great problem that mankind has. This world is under the curse of sin. And all that we see that takes place in this world is traceable back to what happened in the garden. When sin entered into the world and the curse came upon mankind, upon the world itself, the very physical world, we are told in Scripture it groans, waiting to be released on that day when Christ will come again. And our Father, we bless thee that we can look at the cross and see there the remedy for sin. Oh, we thank thee that there's one who hung upon that cross, who came from heaven, who took our nature a body was prepared for him, thy word tells us. And Lord, prepared that he might go to the cross, that he might hang upon that old rugged tree there at Calvary and shed his blood and pour out his life unto death and there give, give himself as a ransom for the many. And O oh Lord, this evening we thank thee for such redemption. We can say there is redemption through the blood, even the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of thy grace. And we pray, our Father, that thou will bless as we gather here this evening. We thank thee for the opportunity to come together, for the desire that is in our hearts to be here. And we pray that thou will bless us. O Lord, draw nigh, whether we're inside the building or outside the building, we thank thee that it doesn't matter, and that the Lord Jesus is able to presence himself with the people we think of those times in Scripture when he himself sat in the open air and he preached and he taught, when there were hundreds and thousands that gathered around him. And, O oh Lord, what mighty power there was in his word. And we pray that thy word this evening will be with power. O oh Lord, own it as it does go forth, even here now as we're gathered here and then over the various online platforms as well. We ask that thou will use the word of God. Lord, our confidence is not in ourselves or in anything that we say, but our confidence is in the Word of God. It is thy Word that is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, it is thy Word that pierces the heart and separates between the soul and the spirit, that is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents. Lord, this is the power that is in the Word of God alone, and therefore we pray that thou would own thy own truth and as it's read and as we preach thy word, we do pray that thou will bless it to every heart, every individual who, who hears, those who are here uh, sitting in cars or uh, in the car park listening, those, Lord, who are even passing by, maybe just walking by on, on the footpath. We pray that, Lord, there would be a word in season, a little thought, a little seed that would fall into someone's heart that would begin there to germinate and take root, and begin to trouble them about their soul and its well-being and its eternal destiny. And that there would be those who would seek the Saviour and come to know him whom to know is life eternal. So grant us thy blessing, we ask of thee. Tarry with us now, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to read some verses of Scripture from Matthew's Gospel. And it's chapter 16. That we want to read some verses, just a few of a conversation that took place between the Lord Jesus Christ and his disciples. And we're reading from verse 13. So it's Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. And we're reading from verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say? But I, the Son of Man, am. And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, 
or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Amen. We'll end there, and we know the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his word this evening to all of our hearts. I want to take you back to verse 15 and to that question that the Lord Jesus asked his disciples. It would seem at this time that possibly the Lord Jesus had taken his disciples up into that region of Caesarea Philippi for a little bit of uh, possibly rest, certainly to get away for a time from the crowds that had been thronging the Savior in the early part of his earthly ministry. Caesarea Philippi is away up in the very north of what was then the land of Israel. It would be in Lebanon today. Way up above even the Sea of Galilee, there's another area of water called the, the water of, of um, Meroz. And it's up in that part of the world, up in, out, up in the slopes of Mount Hermon, that you come upon the place of Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is different from the Caesarea that was on the coast. There was a place along the Mediterranean coast, just out from Jerusalem, west of Jerusalem, if you traveled out to the coast, there was that place that really was the seat of the Roman power because it was much more pleasant than up in the hill country in Jerusalem where the heat would be uh, much more restrictive. But down on the coast, then it would be a little fresher. And that was where the Romans had their seat of power. So there's Caesarea out there on the coast. But this is Caesarea way up to the north, Caesarea Philippi. And the Lord Jesus takes his disciples up into this region. And he's never going to miss an opportunity to speak to them and converse with them. And he begins this discussion by asking them, Whom say men that I am? Now there is a purpose in which and what the Lord Jesus is doing here. And he will get to that purpose eventually. But he begins this, this conversation by asking that question, Whom do, may, may, whom do men say? that I, the Son of Man, am. And the disciples are able to immediately give an answer. And they list there some of the individuals in that verse. It's verse uh, 14. Some say John the Baptist. Some say thou art Elias. Some say that you're Jeremiah the prophet or one of the other prophets that have come back to minister to the people. So there was a, a number of different opinions evidently then. The people generally were not of the same opinion. They were not of the one opinion. So there are some who think this is John the Baptist. Others who think this is Elijah or Elias as it's here called. Or even Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. So there are, there are different opinions among the people as to who it is that the Lord Jesus really is. But the Lord Jesus then made it very personal. And it's that personal question that I want us to think upon for a little while this evening. Because he said to his disciples, But whom say ye that I am? Not, not just the people generally. Not just the, the opinions that are there among the multitudes and the numerous individuals who came to, to listen to the Lord Jesus, who observed him who evidently came into contact with the disciples. No, it's not just the, the general opinion of the people and all the different opinions that there were. The Lord Jesus says, whom, whom do you say that I am? And how important it is what our personal 
opinion is of Jesus Christ. That's absolutely important. Most important. There's, there's no more important thing in all the world. And what do we think of Jesus Christ? What think ye of Christ? That question is actually framed like that. In Matthew's Gospel as well, just a little further over, there was that question, Whom think, what think ye of Christ? And here in this particular place, the Lord Jesus is turning that question around slightly and he's saying, Well, whom do you say that I am? You see, that brings us really to what it is that we are to think about. What is it that we are to consider about Jesus Christ? What, what is it that's important about what we think of him? Well, who is he? Who is he? Because that's, that's what's important. Because it's because of who he is that makes him the saviour of sinners. He's the God-man. He's the Son of God come into this world, taking our nature in order to go to the cross and to die there for sinners. He's the God-man. And therefore, it's vitally important what we think of Jesus Christ. And that's why this question even comes to us this evening. Whom do ye say that I am? That makes it very personal. And what is our personal opinion of Jesus Christ? What do we think of him? Well, that's what I want us to consider for a little while. And what I want to do is to draw your attention to four different individuals who express their opinion of Jesus Christ. Four different individuals through his, through his ministry. Some at the beginning of his ministry, some to the, the middle of those years. And then also the opinion of, Christ, of what they had of Christ at the close of his life when he was hanging on the cross. Four different individuals and what they thought of Jesus Christ. I want you first of all to consider the opinion of the cynic. The opinion of the cynic. Because at the very early part of the Saviour's ministry, when he was calling his disciples to come and to follow him, in John's Gospel chapter 1, we read about Philip finding his friend Nathaniel. Philip had come to believe on Jesus Christ. And being a true believer, he wanted others to come to know Christ as well. He had an evangelistic spirit, an evangelistic desire for his friend, that his friend would also come to know Jesus Christ. And we read there in John's Gospel, chapter 1, that Philip goes and finds Nathanael, and he says to Nathanael, We have found the Messiah. We have found the Messiah. And the Word of God records what Nathaniel's opinion was of that information. And when his friend came and said this to him, We have found the Messiah. It tells us in verse 46 that Nathaniel said this with a cynical spirit. Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Because Philip had told Nathaniel, you see, where they had found him and where he was from. He says, we have found the Messiah. He's Jesus of Nazareth. And here's the cynic's response. Is there any good thing that comes out of that place? That was in Galilee. That was a particular part of Galilee that people didn't have a very high opinion of. The people of Nazareth and the place of Nazareth. And yet it was to that place, that lowly place, that the Lord Jesus was born and brought up and lived in those early days of his life here on earth. But here's the cynic's response. Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? But when you think about that response of Nathaniel, is it not an example of many today? And they've got a, a cynical attitude about Jesus Christ. They're skeptical and distrustful. They're those who are suspicious and doubtful about the things of God. They're, they're those who are scoffers, downright deniers of the things of God. There's always the opinion of the cynic. Well, thankfully, Nathaniel didn't always remain with the thoughts of the cynic because he did come eventually to believe on the Lord Jesus. But the answer that he gave at this particular time it is expressive. It is an illustration of the thoughts of many, even those today, among our friends, 
neighbours, family members maybe, those who live out around about us, those who are even passing by while we're gathered here. There are those who have a cynical spirit against the things of God. Very little interest, very little care, very little thought about their soul. Very cynical towards religion and towards anything that has to do with their spiritual being. Well, my friend, surely such a thing is folly. Because when we think about this question, well, what think ye of Christ and whom do ye say that I am? This question has great importance for our eternal destiny. And those who are cynical about Christ and in life will discover that he is no friend of theirs in death. He's the friend of the sinner who seeks him, who calls upon him, who acknowledges their need of him. He's going to be the judge of the cynic. He's going to be the judge of the cynic one day. They're going to stand before him and they're going to, to see the reality of these things. Whether they acknowledge them now or not, they certainly will one day that is, is going to come to pass. I trust that we do not have the opinion of the cynic and we look despisingly upon Jesus Christ and we want nothing to do with Jesus Christ. That is fatal for our eternal well-being. I want you secondly to think about the answer, the opinion of the centurion. And here we are coming right to the very end of the Saviour's life to when he was hanging upon the cross. And if we think about the question again, he asked his disciples, Whom do ye say that I am? You'll remember something of the words of the centurion. He was, he was an eyewitness of all that happened. He had a ringside seat. He was even overseeing the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus and the two thieves that were crucified along with him. So this man was up close to all that was going by. He may well even have observed something of the Lord's trial in, in the judgment hall of Pilate. He may well have been standing there in the background waiting for orders, waiting for command from Pilate as to what he was going to do. He had a ringside seat. In those closing hours of the Saviour's life prior to his crucifixion, this man was up close. This man could see what was taking place. This man heard everything that was being said at that particular time. And it tells us in the Word of God, in Mark's Gospel, for example, chapter 15 and verse 3, that at that moment when the Lord Jesus did die, it says that he gave up the ghost and as he did so, we know that he cried out. That last cry that came from his lips, It is finished. It is complete. Referring to the work that his father had given him to do the work of redemption. So the Savior cries out and he gives up the ghost. And the centurion who had observed and who had witnessed and who had heard and who had seen all that was taking place this is what this man had to say of Jesus Christ. Truly, this man was the Son of God. Oh, he had realized this man is no ordinary individual. As he observed him up close, as he listened, this is what he had to say. And if we ask the centurion, well, what think ye of Christ? Who do you say that he is? What do you say of Jesus Christ? Well, the centurion says... Truly this man was the Son of God. This man was the Son of God. No ordinary man. And you see that's what highlights what is the most important thing about the person of Jesus Christ. He is no ordinary man. For Jesus Christ is the God-man. That's what makes him the saviour of sinners. That's what makes him the only saviour of sinners this evening. There is no other saviour. There is no other way to heaven but through Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ alone is the God-man. The Father said from heaven, This is my beloved Son. This, this person, 
speaking about the person of Jesus Christ. This person is my beloved son. Hear ye him. That's the instruction from heaven with regards to the God-man. Hear him. Hear him. And may we indeed be those who hear him, who listen to what he has to say. And we find what he has to say in this book. And this book will direct us to the cross and to the cross work of Jesus Christ, the cross work of the God-man, because that's what gives his blood value. We were singing there that opening hymn that tells us to step out on the promise and get under the blood. What is it that gives the blood of Jesus Christ worth and value tonight? It's because it's the blood of the God-man. It wasn't the blood of any ordinary individual, even a good man or a perfect man. It was the blood of the God-man. And that's why tonight there's cleansing power in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Because the worth and the value of that blood is that of the eternal God-man. And here, the centurion, if he's he's called to answer this question, but whom say ye that I am? The centurion said, truly, this man was the Son of God. I want you in the third place to think about the answer of the Savior's companion. And that brings us back to this portion of Scripture that we have just read a few verses from. Because Peter was very quick to answer this question. Peter was impetuous. He often had that habit of jumping in before everybody else, either by way of conduct or by way of of what he had to say. Sometimes the Lord Jesus had to rebuke him. But the Lord didn't have to rebuke him on this occasion. He didn't have to say to Peter, Peter, you don't know what you're saying. Not on this occasion. And we're told what Peter had to say when They were asked that question, the disciples, but whom say ye that the Son of Man, that I am? We find Peter answering verse 16, Matthew 16 and verse 16. Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. You see, Peter is acknowledging him to be the God-man, but Peter is also acknowledging him to be the Messiah. Thou art the Christ. Thou art the Messiah. Christ and Messiah is the same terms, just in two different languages. So Peter says, Thou art the Christ. Thou art the Messiah, the Son of the living God. You see, that underscores the point that Jesus Christ is God's appointed way of salvation. He is the Son of God who has come into the world. He's also the Messiah. And the Word has the idea of the Anointed One, appointed to a particular office and a particular work. Jesus Christ is the one who is appointed to the work of saving sinners. And my friend, if your soul and my soul is ever to be saved, never to be in heaven, it will be by Jesus Christ and by Him alone. You'll not be saved by what you do. You'll not be saved by who you are. You'll be saved by Jesus Christ or you will not be saved at all. That is how it is for each and every one of us. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. There's only one name that is published among men and that it is the name of Jesus Christ. And Peter here hit the nail right on the head when he said, Thou art the Christ the Son of the living God. And may we come to see Jesus Christ in that way. As Peter here made this great confession, and the Lord Jesus went on to commend him, because he said in the next verse, Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Oh, there is a blessing not only in this life, but in eternity to come. If we come to know and have it revealed unto us that Jesus Christ is the way of salvation. And may God indeed reveal that unto each one under the sound of my voice this evening. 
May we know for sure. May it be something that we have been enlightened and instructed in by the Lord himself. That Jesus Christ is the only saviour of sinners. And if I do not come to him, I will perish. I'll be lost in hell forever. There's one final individual that I want you to consider. And that's the opinion of the convert. The opinion of the convert. That takes us back to the little town of, little village of Bethany. And to the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And to that occasion when Lazarus died. And the Savior was not there. In fact, he delayed his coming. And Lazarus had died and he was already buried when the Lord Jesus and his disciples finally arrive in Bethany. And finally arrive at the home of Mary and Martha. And they were struck with grief. And both of them said to the Lord Jesus on separate occasions, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But the Lord Jesus was going to do something miraculous. As we know, he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead and demonstrate his mighty power in raising the dead. It is, it's needful that Christ can raise the dead. Because in order to save your soul and my soul, Jesus Christ must have the power to raise the dead. For you and I are dead in trespasses and in sins. He must be able to give new life to where there is deadness. And he demonstrated that on that occasion and others as well. When he raised Lazarus from the dead. But in John's, chap John's Gospel chapter 11 verse 26. The Lord Jesus said, Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And then the Lord said to Martha, Believest thou this? So he was putting her on the spot. Do you believe this, Martha? In the face of death, do you believe this? When you yourself have suffered bereavement and your brother has been taken away, do you believe this? Do you believe that whoso liveth and believeth in me shall never die? Well, you have our answer in the next verse. John eleven twenty seven. She said, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Yea, Lord. She was asked the question personally, Do you believe? And she says, Yea, Lord, I believe. I wonder, can we say that this evening? In all truth, in our own heart, can we say, yes, I believe? Well, what is it that we believe? It's just not a matter of believing something or believing anything. It's not a matter just of being sincere about what we believe. There's many people who are sincere, but they're sincerely wrong. What is it that she believed? That's what's important. Well, she tells us what she believed. She says, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And here she is, in a sense, answering this question. When the Lord Jesus asked that of the disciples, but whom say ye that I am? And we've thought about in different individuals there and how there is the focusing in on him being the God-man. He's the Son of God come into the world. He's the Messiah. He's the Anointed One, the Appointed One to be the Savior of sinners. And here it's all coming together in Martha's great confession. And here's the opinion of the convert. I believe. Well, what do you believe? I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of of God which should come into the world. You see, faith in Christ in this regard is saving faith. This is saving faith. This is faith that saves the soul. This is faith that forgives sin. This is the faith that secures heaven. Are we able to say such words this evening? Can you say, I believe, and then be clear and emphatic as to what it is you believe? There's many people and you, you speak to them today and they say, oh, I believe. It's, it's nearly a throwaway line. Just to maybe they think that somehow we'll, we'll shut down the conversation. 
We don't want this conversation to go too far about the things of God, about my soul and eternal well-being. Therefore they'll say, oh, I believe. Well, it's not enough just to say, I believe. What do you believe in? What do I believe in? That's what's important. And Martha here says, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ. I believe that thou art God's means of salvation. I believe that thou art the Son of God. There's power, therefore, to save, and power to cleanse, and power to give new life. I believe it, Martha said. I believe that thou art the one who was to come into the world. My friend, are you a believer? Are you a believer? If you go way over to Revelation chapter 21, the opening verses of that chapter tell you something about the wonders of heaven. And then you come to that verse, it introduces a contrast, and it tells you those who will not be in heaven. And it says, but the unbelieving. That's the very first category of those who will not be in heaven but the unbelieving will not be in heaven the unbeliever will not be in heaven let's be clear about that tonight if you are unbelieving then you will never be in heaven you must be like Martha here and be able to say I believe I believe thou art the Christ I believe thou art the son of God I believe thou art the one who came into the world to save sinners. And may we be able therefore personally to answer that question. But whom say ye that I am? May we be able tonight to answer it just as, as fulsome as Martha did. And know what it is to have the joy of believing. I trust the Lord will bless his word. To all of our hearts this evening, for his name's sake. We'll just bow together in prayer for a moment. Our Father, we pray thou will bless thy word as it has gone forth. O Lord, we pray that we might indeed have the opinion of the convert, of the believer, and be able to say, I believe. I believe thou art the Christ, the Son of God, who should come into the world. Write thy word upon hearts. We pray, Lord, there'll be a word in season, a word to the unsaved especially, even those passing by. Lord, we pray there'll be a word in season. Have mercy upon us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.